on the face of it, the death of Jesus looks simply like a man-made tragedy and a grave miscarriage of justice. But the extraordinary darkness of verse 33 and the excruciating cry of verse 34, they tell us there is something supernatural that is taking place as Jesus hangs on that cross. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. And today we take a look at what Jesus did accomplish on the cross. And Jonathan, I'd love for you to give us just a little, little bit of context here. When we talk about the extraordinary darkness, the excruciating cry, what, what are you referring to there? Well, as we hear the story of Easter, uh, as we look at the picture of the cross that's given to us in Mark's Gospel, there are certain things that Mark, the Gospel writer, wants to highlight for us from the events of the Easter story and the crucifixion of Jesus. And he wants to highlight, in particular, the darkness that descends at the time of Jesus' death. Even during the daytime, it becomes dramatically dark. And as we set that within the, the context of the story of the Bible, we learn that that darkness carries symbolic significance. And then when Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Again, there's a background to that in the story of the Bible that, that fills it with rich significance. And as we pay attention to those details in the story, we come to a deeper understanding of the meaning of those events. And, and that's something that we're going to explore in our message today. Well, we're going to do that from the book of Mark, chapter 15. So grab a Bible and join us there as we begin our message, Access Restored. Here is Jonathan. One of the great themes of our age is the theme of access. Our television screens and news pages are filled with stories of people trying to gain access to new lands and stories of national leaders seeking to control borders and, and limit access. It's a constant theme, you'll know, in Europe. It's the subject of a major debate in the United States, and it's a topic of much soul-searching here in Canada as well. Good Friday is about many things. It's about pain and injustice. It's about promise and fulfillment. It's about sacrifice and cost. It's about love and forgiveness. It's about death and life. It's about all those things. But in a very fundamental way, Good Friday is about access. Access not to another land or a better life, but access to the very presence of God himself. We've recently been studying the early chapters of the book of Genesis over recent weeks. We've been thinking about life in this world as God created it to be, as it was meant to be. We're told in those early chapters of the opening book of the Bible how God made man and woman and placed the first man and the first woman in a beautiful garden called Eden. You know the story. It was a place where God would meet with his people and where they would have access to him, to friendship with him, and to his life-giving presence. We're told of how God used to come down in the cool of the afternoon and meet with Adam and speak with him as a friend even speaks with his friend. We haven't yet reached the third chapter of Genesis in our little series, but it's a dark chapter. It's the chapter really where everything goes wrong and where the story starts to unravel. The man and the woman, they spurn God's friendship and they reject his rule. They decide to disobey the one prohibition that he has set out for them for life in the garden. And because they do that, their friendship with their maker is severed, and they invite his judgment. Adam and Eve are sent away from the garden, cast out from God's life-giving presence there. And because, of course, God the Creator is the source of all life, separated from him, the man and the woman begin to die. They begin to die physically, and they die spiritually on the day that they leave Eden. And from that point on, really, the story of the Bible is the story of a quest to get back to Eden, 
to have that friendship with God restored, to regain access to him and to his life-giving presence. It's a dramatic story, and as we read it through in a linear way, we don't quite know how it's all going to work out and how the story will end. There are great hints along the way through the Bible's narrative of what God might do and what God would do to restore the relationship and to open up access once more. But it's not until the unjust, tragic, and dark events of Good Friday that we see how God is going to allow his created people into his presence once again. The story of Good Friday is as tragic as it is majestic. We're kind of jumping into the middle of the story here as we land in Mark 15. As we pick up the narrative, we find that the best man who has ever lived has been put on trial on false and trumped up charges. If we had time to read the whole of Mark's gospel and the account of Jesus's life, we would read of a man who had compassion on the needy, who healed the sick, who cared for the poor. We'd read of a preacher who spoke words of grace and hope and truth. We'd observe a life full of integrity and goodness, the like of which we've never seen before or since. But now this man, this Jesus of Nazareth, has been beaten, mocked, and abused. And here he hangs on a Roman cross, the cruelest instrument of torture and death known to the ancient world. And as he hangs dying on this cross for crimes that he did not commit and of which he was not guilty, Mark wants us to see that two very significant things are taking place, two very significant things are happening which will shape and reshape the very course of human history. And the first one is this. At the cross of Jesus, judgment falls. At the cross, judgment falls. Notice verse 33 with me again. At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? On the face of it, the death of Jesus looks simply like a man-made tragedy and a grave miscarriage of justice. But the extraordinary darkness of verse 33 and the excruciating cry of verse 34, they tell us that something else is going on here. It's not simply a human drama. There is something supernatural that is taking place as Jesus hangs on that cross. We might want to write off the darkness of verse 33 as simply a case of heavy cloud cover, a spot of bad weather, but it's clearly more than that. It's a darkness that covers the whole land, the whole earth, and it comes at a time of day when it couldn't possibly be wholly dark. It comes at the sixth hour, that's 12 noon, and it lasts until the ninth hour, that's three in the afternoon. This is no ordinary darkness. It is a supernatural darkness, and it is full of significance. Darkness in the Bible always carries huge symbolic weight. Perhaps the most famous darkness in Scripture comes in the book of Exodus, when Israel is in bondage in Egypt. The Lord sends a series of plagues on the Egyptians to punish them for their mistreatment of his people. And one of those great judgments is the plague of darkness that covers the land of Egypt. It is a sign of the Lord's great displeasure and of his judgment of evil. When divine darkness falls, it is a fearful thing. And remarkably, when Jesus, the righteous one, this sinless man, the Son of God himself, dies this death of injustice, God's judgment falls. 
we might assume that his judgment should be falling on the evildoers who are the perpetrators of this great crime, who have subjected Jesus to this great act of cruelty. But the words of Jesus in verse 34 tell us that this darkness is actually falling on him. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As he dies, Jesus, the Son of God, the sinless one, the righteous one, this compassionate healer and this teacher of grace, the Son sent from heaven above, Jesus himself is aware that the judgment of God is falling on him. He himself is facing the very anger of God the judge. On the cross of Good Friday, Jesus, the sinless Son, bore my judgment and your judgment for the wrong that we have done. Remarkably, astoundingly, he faced the judgment that we deserve. That's the first thing that takes place as Jesus dies. Judgment falls. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. Our message is called Access Restored. And today we're taking a look at Mark chapter 15, verses 33 to 39. If you joined us a little late, grab a Bible, have it handy, because we're going to get back to this message in just a moment. By the way, if you did join us late, you can still listen online. Come to our website, EncounterTheTruth.org. You can go back and listen to what you missed. If you ever miss a broadcast in its entirety, you're going to find it archived there as well. It's EncounterTheTruth.org. Another way to listen, the Encounter the Truth app. The uh, app is available at your favorite app store, and it's free. Just simply look for Encounter the Truth. Again, our website, if you want to connect with us, it's EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, Jonathan, you are passionate about teaching God's Word and doing so effectively, and you've got an upcoming conference called the Timothy Trust. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, that's right, Steve, and that's why we've taken the opportunity to partner with the Timothy Trust to run the Timothy Trust National Conference this year, which is a conference aimed to equip Bible teachers to faithfully handle and teach the Word of God. Our our theme this year is the Living and Enduring Word. And we're so privileged to welcome a number of outstanding speakers to join me at this conference. We've got uh, Josh Moody of God-Centered Life and the College Church in Wheaton, Illinois. We've got Dr. Herschel York, who's dean of the seminary at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. And we've got David Short, who is pastor of St. John's Anglican Church in Vancouver, Canada. And together we're going to be contemplating what it means to preach and proclaim the living and enduring Word of God in an age such as this. And we'd love for listeners to join us, particularly those who are involved in Bible teaching ministry. The conference is going to take place in Ottawa, Canada, and will be on May 27th to 29th. To find out more, have a look on our website, encounterthetruth.org slash equipping. That's EncounterTheTruth.org slash equipping. And join us in Ottawa, May 27 to 29. Well, again, if you want to find out more information about this upcoming conference, you can visit our website, EncounterTheTruth.org slash equipping, or call us at 833-998-7884. That's 1-833-99-TRUTH. Well, if you did join us a little bit late, we're in the book of Mark, chapter 15, as we continue our message access restored. Once again, here is Jonathan. The next thing that happens is tied to the first, and it's no less significant. As Jesus dies and as judgment falls, Mark wants us to see that access is restored. Verse 37, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Many here will remember that fateful day nearly 30 years ago when the Berlin Wall came tumbling down amid scenes of chaos and jubilation. November the 9th, 1989 stands as a watershed in modern history. The world changed forever that day and many lives in many nations were transformed as a result. 
But the historical significance of that day and the transformations that it brought about, they pale into insignificance when compared to the transformation brought about on the day when Jesus died 2,000 years ago. The Berlin Wall had stood for less than three decades. It divided societies culturally and militarily and economically. But the curtain of the temple in Jerusalem, it represented a barrier that had stood from the earliest days of human history, right from Genesis chapter 3. And it divided not man from man, human being from human being, but humanity from God himself. Although we were created to enjoy God's presence, to enjoy the life that the maker alone can give, our rebellion, well, it led to judgment and exclusion and ultimately death. That's the story that the Bible tells us. But because Jesus bore the penalty for our sin, he bore the judgment for our sin on that first Good Friday, because he died the death that we deserve, God has once again opened access to his life-giving presence. The temple in Jerusalem was God's symbolic dwelling here on earth. Although he could not allow sinful people into his presence, just to wander in, he did come down and rest his presence in the sanctuary at the heart of the temple. And he allowed the priests to approach him in order to offer sacrifices once a year. And within the temple, there were two curtains that kept the general public from seeing or entering the presence of God. But at the moment of Jesus' death on Calvary, one of those great curtains was torn. And notice that it was torn, verse 38, from top to bottom. What's the symbolism of that? What's the significance? God himself tore that curtain, and he removed the barrier between himself and his people. The destruction of that wall in Jerusalem was a kind of grassroots activity. The people took charge, and as much as anything else, the events of that day signified the fact that the Soviet leadership had lost control of what was going on. The tide of history was against them, and it had overwhelmed them. But the tearing of the curtain at the temple in Jerusalem That was a decision taken from above, orchestrated from above. It was an action, if you like, carried out by divine hands. And what's the significance? This top-to-bottom tearing of the curtain in the temple of Jerusalem, it tells us that the price has been paid. It tells us that judgment for sin has fallen and has been fully satisfied. It tells us that relationship with God is now open to us once more. And it tells us that life, eternal life, which is available only through God and only in his presence, it is now available to each one of us again. It's a wonderful offer, but none of it is automatic. It's for those who will respond in true faith and accept what he has done. Our Father, we marvel at the fact that the Lord Jesus gave himself for us, that he bore the judgment that was reserved for us, and he died the death that was ours to die. And we thank you that because he did that, Access to your presence is open once more. Friendship with you is ours. And the way of life is open before us. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Jonathan Griffiths with the message called Access Restored. You're listening to Encounter the Truth. Glad you've tuned in today. And if you're benefiting from listening, we'd be so encouraged to get your feedback. Let us know how God is using this program in your life. Just come to our website, EncounterTheTruth.org, and click on the contact link. Once again, our website address is EncounterTheTruth.org. Encounter the Truth is listener-supported. That means we depend on your financial generosity to keep Jonathan's teaching on this station. And as you give a gift of any amount this month, Jonathan, you have picked out a book called The Case for Easter, written by Lee Strobel. And how do you envision somebody using and reading this book? Well, I've, I've got two uses in mind for this book, and I, I hope that this will hit home for many of our listeners today. First of all, for the Christian believer who wants to be reassured and reconvinced of the historicity of the events in which we place our trust as believers, I'd love you to get hold of this and go over the evidence for the resurrection. You know, we, we don't believe in myth and legend. We are believing in historical reality that is conveyed to us in the Word of God, but is grounded in real history. And I'd love for you to be convinced and reconvinced of that. And then for the for the person who is not yet a convinced Christian believer, but is engaging with the evidence, who wants to find out more, you need to know whether the resurrection of Jesus Christ actually happened. And I think this book is going to be a real help to you in persuading you of the evidence for the resurrection, which is real and substantial, and I'd love to get this book into your hands if that's your situation. And of course, for the believer who is thinking of friends and family in that place, hey, get a hold of this book and give it to your loved ones that they might read it this Easter. Well, the book is called The Case for Easter. Our thank you gift to you is you financially support Encounter the Truth this month. The phone number to give a gift, 1-833-99-TRUTH. That's 1-833-998-7884, or you can give online at EncounterTheTruth.org. You can also write us at Encounter the Truth, 2176 Prince of Wales Drive, Ottawa, Ontario, 2KE0A1. Or in the U.S., at Encounter the Truth, 215 North Arlington Heights Road, number 102, Arlington Heights, Illinois, 60004. Well, next time on Encounter the Truth, we're going to jump to the book of 1 Corinthians. We're going to be in chapter 15, and Jonathan is going to show us how death is defeated, how Paul invites us to confront this great enemy that we all face, and then how Easter is all about sharing in Christ's great victory. We are thinking about and considering together the most fundamental issue any of us will ever face, the issue of death and the hope of eternal life. We all know that death will come to us sooner or later, and for many in our world, the reality of death and the prospect of death is as terrifying as it is heartbreaking. We can rationalize and sanitize death all we like. We can try and make death as painless medically as possible. We can even induce it to come at a convenient time. We can organize a nice funeral and choose an attractive burial plot. But we all know that death is ugly and death is cruel. Death means dreams that don't come true. Death means hopes that will never be fulfilled. Death means potential that is snuffed out. Death means loving relationships severed by the grave. Death is the great enemy of humanity. Death is my enemy, and death is your enemy. But the message of Easter, the life-giving and hope-restoring message of Easter is this. Although death is an ugly enemy and a cruel enemy, praise God, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, death is a vanquished enemy. That's the message of Easter. And that's the message that we celebrate together here this morning. We're going to focus our attention this morning on just two verses from the passage that I read, verses 56 and 57. And in these two verses, the Apostle Paul invites us to confront this great enemy of death, to understand its power. And then having confronted the enemy, he calls us to see the great victory that Jesus has achieved, and he calls us even to participate in it. 
That's next time in Encounter the Truth. By the way, if you ever miss a program, you can come and listen online. Our website address is EncounterTheTruth.org. For Jonathan Griffiths and our producer, Mark Bretta, I'm Steve Hiller. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time.